And there's the lovely Elise. All right. So Carly Scott Murphy. Hi. Hi, Elise. Lovely to meet you. I'm sorry we haven't spoken earlier. So for those of you that don't know Carly Scott Murphy, um, she uh, is actually, I have to say, a personal friend and someone who spent a lot of time sorting out. I was getting messages all the way through about how to make that presentation work. Um, she works for Microsoft and got an amazing background experience in systems implementation. She moved to Microsoft to sort of work in their TA. Now working in people analytics and it's been glorious to watch her through get cleverer. Now Elise works with Oz and I think Sam is part of the team there, isn't she? Our yes she is. Favourite Sandra and yep. um, it, um, are going through the process of looking at, as I understand it, your engagement, uh, surveys and data, and then looking, working with Microsoft about how you can take it a step further. A work in progress, and I'm going to be really interested to hear how we can use the data available um, in your organisation to come up with great employee insights. I'll leave it to you. Thanks so much, Andrea, and thank you very much for having us here today. Um, hopefully we won't have any issues with slides because we're not going to do slides today. We're going to have a conversation, which uh, I think should be fabulous. So before we start, I just wanted to do a quick acknowledgement to country and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting here today uh, and where you're uh, joining us from around uh, Australia and potentially around the world. So for me uh, and for Elise as well, uh, we're a part of the Wurundjeri um, people and the Kulin Nations uh, um, land that we're working on today and we want to pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So with that, I wanted to just kick off and really just give uh, everybody a bit of an overview and, uh, and um, before we uh, get right into the questions with Elise, just first of all, setting the expectation of today's session. Um, the title is really Beyond Engagement and Thinking More Strategically About People Data. Um, and um, we really want to, uh, I really want to kind of explore this uh, a lot with, uh, with uh, the audience today. Um, a lot because, you know, from, from my history, and I'll, and I'll introduce myself a little bit more in a minute, but from my history from being in HR, there's been a lot of focus on just engagement uh, data as being sort of the the, the pinnacle of, of people's strategic kind of reporting. You know, that's what we're all striving for. We need to get that information. We're putting that into our annual reports. We're living and dying by, you know, two points up, three points down uh, in that score. So what I'm really here today to, to help share with you and, uh, and hopefully uh, with Elise's help today, or I know with Elise's help today, we'll go through kind of some of the other things that you can be thinking about in this particular area to really, um, you know, help you give foundation so that you can get that seat at that strategic table that we've all been talking about for years by bringing some more um, uh, objective data to, to the business. So first of all, um, let's uh, let's introduce ourselves. Um, so I'm a, a storyteller really with Microsoft and, and as part of my role, I really love thinking about how behavioural data can really make an impact to organisations. I started my career, as I said, in, in HR and in talent acquisition, so I, I really relate to, to the audience out there. Um, and, and really way back when I was uh, first, when I first met Andrea actually uh, many, many years ago, um, really started to think about about, you know, how can we be more strategic about our reporting data um, in people um, and not just kind of look at headcount or turnover and, and these days, you know, things like engagement surveys. Um, I, I um, have a global role. I work with our engineering team uh, over in, in the States where it really um, I connect the customers uh, with our engineering team and look at how we can develop products. So Microsoft VB you might have heard of too. I'm, I'm kind of part of that team. Uh, the local representative for our engineering team. So Elise, I'm just going to hand over to you to uh, have a, a bit of an introduction of yourself uh, and what you do and uh, and your role at Osnet. Yeah, sure. Thanks for that. Um, thanks for having me. Um, 
So I'm in a newly established role. And, and when I say newly established, I'm talking about the last couple of months or so. So it's um, become a bit of a, a focus and a priority for us at Osnet Services. Um, my role is head of employee experience and analytics. Um, and, and essentially, it, it's been established recently um, to really have a look across everything we do in the um, across the people life cycle um, and to really come at it from a human centered design um, perspective and to help accelerate what we do to really focus on the employee experience. Um, so we're only a couple of months in and we're, we're kicking things off. Um, it also has a heavy analytics piece. And, and, you know, whilst we'll be talking about that today, you know, I won't profess to be an expert in this space. We really are starting to look at what is the possibility um, for our organisation. And, and, and to Carly's point, how do we take it from much more than just here's turnover data, here's engagement data? What are the insights? What, what, what can we really drive and change? Yeah, um, thank you. That's all right. Just one thing. I don't have an analytics background. I won't profess. I come from a, um, a HR generalist background and, and kind of HR leadership roles, but in, in a generalist space. So I have business knowledge, um, but I, I think that's a great place to start in terms of understanding the business. Exactly. And today's conversation that we're having, you know, we've had a chat um, in the last few days about this as well, is really um, the, the, the idea about this conversation today is really to explore how you got to the point where you are today. Um, not necessarily, you know, looking at in detail, you know, what, uh, uh, what the strategy is and what the products can do and what you're going to explore. I think we'll touch on a lot of that. But really, I wanted to kind of give the audience a, a bit of an overview of what, what, how did you get to where you are today? Because I think that's an important step. You know, you see organisations like NAB who have like big people analytics teams, they're doing a lot of strategic work, which can be quite scary from an HR uh, point of view in, in a smaller organisation than NAB, right? So having you here today is really going to be great to, to look at that start of that journey and see where you You've got to and, and how you've uh, um, you know how you've come to where you're going oh sorry how you've come to where you are <laughs> right and where you're going right here we go um anyway right so let's let's set the scene today so I'm just going to do a bit of a brief kind of overview about why again why we're why we're kind of here and then we'll get into the questions I think we've got about half an hour and we're actually going to be sitting on tables so you can come and have a chat to us as well but also yeah pop in pop in the chat um, if you've got questions, and we'll definitely uh, um, get to those as we go along. So, as I mentioned to the start, you know we've we've got what what I can see and what I feel out there is a very strong and very heavy reliance on on engagement survey data. Um, it is very important that we look at this particular data, but are we putting too many eggs in one in one particular basket? Right. So I think there is a place for us to be able to understand the feelings, but our conversation here today is, but what if we could take that and then understand the behaviours of what's happening within the organisation to help us understand what's happening in terms of those behaviours, put change programs in place, and then being able to measure those behaviour changes as well as the sentiment changes across the organisation. I think one thing to, to kind of be aware of too uh, uh, um, and um, from an engagement survey data is we're actually asking people to take time out of their day to uh, create or to, to respond to those surveys, right? So we're taking time out of their revenue generating activities. Now, if we're talking from an HR perspective, it's very important that we understand the drivers of the business and the strategy of the business and talk in their language. So if we're consistently saying, well, we need to do another poll survey, we need to do um, more and more surveys. Yes, that's great. But we also need to look at other ways where we're not taking people out of revenue generating activity to get the data that we need to look at. So if we start to think about these behavioural insights and what I'm talking about here is we're looking at those insights that we can get from our daily activities. So from a Microsoft perspective, I think, um, you know, a majority of, of, of organisations uh, around the globe are on using Microsoft technology in terms of Office 365. And so we're talking about the, the data that's generated or the signals that are generated from as I'm sitting here today with Elise, we've got a calendar invitation in our diary and we can see um, the, the activity that's happening between me and Elise, but 
I do need to be particularly careful here because what we're looking at is aggregate data, not specifically me and Elise, but us in, in general in the organisation. So we're looking at how our um, employees collaborate and connect with each other through meetings, through emails, um, and through things like Teams interactions and, and chat. And the reason we're doing this is really from measuring productivity, it's a lot harder to understand um, or understand the impact that our knowledge workers are having. So if we can combine this information, this behavioural information with sentiment and also things like um, outputs like um, sales or revenue generation, et cetera, we can start to kind of understand the behaviours that are leading towards um, better revenue generation. So for example, things like, you know, what does good look like for our salespeople? Can we encourage better sales because we can look at how big are their networks? How much time are they spending with um, uh, their customers? And in all of this, I just reiterate, we're looking at this from an aggregate perspective. So hopefully that's kind of given uh, a bit of an overview of what we're looking at today and what we're referencing when we're talking behavioral insights here. So Elise, tell me a little bit about Oznet and what they do. Let's start with that. No, sure. And I'm conscious um, most people won't um, have, a, have a good view. So we're in the energy industry. We're essentially an energy assets company. So um, we don't generate um, energy, whether that be, you know, solar farms, etc. We don't do that. We actually own the transmission system in Victoria. Um, so the big towers you see along the freeways, etc. that take energy, and we also have a gas network as well, but take energy from where it's generated um, through to what a, a distribution network, and we own um, the distribution network for parts of Victoria, um, then that takes it down to households and businesses, etc. So we don't generate and we're not a retail company. We're not the person that, we're not the company that sends you your bill. We sit in that middle space of essentially moving energy. So you've got a lot of knowledge workers in the organisation, right, that you need to be looking at how they're, how they're being productive, right, as long yeah. as they're them. Yeah, yeah, cool. Absolutely. So, I mean, our journey, our journey together is, has been more recent, but over that time, I've seen a bit of a shift in, in strategy from Osnet. So what's, what's happened recently? What's kind of spurred this on? Yeah, I, I guess it, it, it's really driven by um, the energy industry overall. So it's at a, I suppose, a real, um, I suppose, a real inflection point and a point of change. Um, so traditionally, you know, networks haven't changed much. You know, we've generated through coal-fired power stations and we've, you know, it's been a one-way transfer of energy. Um, technology um, and I suppose the transition to um, more sustainable energy, whether that be, you know, generating yourself on, on, your, on your house or, or, you know, major wind farms, etc., um, is actually is changing the industry industry to make it a more decentralized model. So instead of one way, it's actually a connected network now. We're moving towards that. And so what that's driving is one, um, I suppose, a transition to a, a more sustainable energy future, but um, customers and consumers having more choice in terms of how they how they um, generate, use and store their energy as well. So I, I guess that's um, that's been a pivotal shift for us um, in, in terms of our strategy, but also um, across the industry. Yeah, look, and I think what what's driving that, and I'm sure a lot of people on the call can can understand in terms of of that change uh, and that pivot that organisations are going through. But that's really looking at driving innovation, and we need to start thinking about, you know, how are we giving our employees the ability, you know, the time to innovate, or are we in back to back meetings, for example, and just that uh, autonomy as well to be able to 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 do their their jobs, right? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So um, I'm, I'm, you, you mentioned at the start your, your role is relatively new to the organisation. Yeah. Um, how, um, you know, why was this role established? What, what was so important about creating this role? Yeah, certainly. So we had um, a new um, executive general manager for our people and safety area, Joe McConnell, joined us, I think, uh, probably mid to late last year. Um, and she's come from, um, you know, great background with Latitude, BHP. And she's actually done and seen this in previous organisations. And she's seen the value um, of doing so. So I think one of her um, things she did pretty quickly was actually establish this role and this function because she knew the value that could be driven um, from it. So um, from that sense, it, it, it was a, you know, it, it was a relatively um, quick establishment and not necessarily something we had to go to the business with a business case on. We, we actually had a leader that came in and saw the opportunity. Yeah, and I think that's that's the important thing. I think if we're to provide some advice to, to people on the call is really to start thinking about 
who might be those sponsors within the organization that can help you? Where does value sit? And it doesn't necessarily have to be in your chief people officer. While it is in this case, the experience that I had in, in conversations with the team at Osnet, it was the chief data officer, it was the operations officer, the whole, the whole executive were actually really um, really passionate about data and what can we do with data? I mean, you you guys are a data organisation, right? So yeah. I think it's about establishing that person. Um, and, and to that point, right, for, for people out there, that sponsor for, for using this data may be sitting in your sales, you know, the head of your sales organisation, or it might be your chief operating officer. Because if you can prove this data can help with things like productivity, if it can give people more time to do revenue, revenue generating activities, like looking at meeting culture and reducing meeting, um, you know, long and large meetings, etc. you know, you can start looking at other areas. So, you know, you've definitely got some great support from, from your executive, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've we've touched on it um, before, and obviously Joe's Joe's been in the in the area of really um, looking at more strategic people initiatives. What were you doing beforehand? Yeah, sure. I think what we we're doing is probably what a lot of organisations were doing. You know, we would run an annual engagement survey, so we'd have um, you know in, engagement results, and it was you know it may have been annual or biannual. We've 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 been to numerous models. Um, you know, we were reporting on things like turnover, gender, etc. But it really was just reporting. There was you know not a lot of insights, not a lot of um, looking at what's behind that data. And, and I suppose we haven't been driving that at a, a senior and executive level to really add value. So yeah. um, I, I think what we're doing is probably not too dissimilar to what most organ where most organisations are at. Yeah, and I think I think one of the the things I hear a lot in my discussions uh, with customers out there is really around uh, you know, we're not really doing much with the data, so we need to think more strategically. So if you are doing an engagement survey, that's great, but what are you actually doing with that? And so if you can combine it with some of that behavioural data, you can get a lot more depth and a lot more traction in the organisation. So it's great to hear you're on that engagement survey uh, path. So you've, you've recently made a change, right? So um, to your engagement survey provider, talk me through that process. Why, why did that happen? Yeah, so we're in the process of um, transitioning. So we, we've used numerous kind of engagement and culture surveys in the past. Um, you know, I won't go into detail on all of them, but I think that the challenge has been that a, a couple of things, um, the language they often use is not the language of, of, of the business, but also, um, you know, the time period. Often, you know, there are annual, biannual type, um, you know, type thing. And, you um, and, and also the access to the data once you've actually done those surveys is not quick. You often do it by the time you actually get the results and digest them, you're four months down the track and the world's changed. So um, we have made a, a move and we are, um, and we are using um, Glint now to actually, well, not only are we testing engagement, but to actually have pulse um, pulse surveys. So we're actually building in a, a, a cadence that we run actually short, short surveys every month, um, every four weeks. And it, there's only, you know, a handful of questions. It takes less than five minutes, but a cadence around really looking at these and having a regular view of um, engagement, um, employee sentiment, et cetera, and trying to build that in with how, uh, you know, leaders focus on and then talk to their teams as well. Yeah, and I think you know that's that's super exciting to to kind of hear that that kind of poll survey and that, those actions being taken. And I think one of the things that you know we're um, we're working together on is is getting a, a, a dashboard that's out of the box in in the capability you've got to combine that glint data. So starting to think about the the sentiment about um, you know feeling um, you know feeling empowered, feeling um, disengaged, for example, and combining that with behavioural data to kind of understand is that because this section of your organisation and that could be leaders, it could be females, it could be um, it could be your role type, for example, you know, what, what are the behaviours? Are they working like long, long weeks? Are they actually working a lot of after hours? You know, are they feeling, you know, are their networks smaller? So that that disengagement from, you know, not feeling connected. So that's going to be super exciting when we see that. Um, so you you um, we've had that discussion around um, behavioural data, and actually we did um, 
we did have a chat in our previous um, conversation about diversity and I mentioned something about um, gender splitting there. Diversity is important to AGL. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things you're thinking about in this particular area um, with, yeah. with combining that behaviour and that sentiment? Yeah, sure. So we've got, um, you know, we've got a big focus on, on gender diversity in particular, um, you know, to the nature of the industry we're in, you know, our, I think our workforce profile is around 75% male, 25% female. Um, and so, you know, I'd like to get behind that and understand some of the reasons for, you know, differences in turnover, what, what's, dri what's driving areas like that, how do we actually drive and understand how we attract, you know, attract more females, but also retain, but what are, you know, how do we kind of look at correlating data to understand, well, perhaps what are some of the mobility issues that are occurring for different segments of our workforce, whether it be female workers or part-time workers, which, you know, go, go hand in hand um, uh, at, a higher, at a higher rate. What are some of the issues once there or challenges or barriers that we don't even know about in our organisation that we can look at to go, okay, we, you know, this is a hypothesis, okay, we're seeing less mobility once someone becomes part-time or et cetera, or we're seeing females leave at a higher rate because of X. So really looking at correlating data sets to, to try and get behind some of the, you know, to get behind and provide some insights into the the standard data we'd report on, which is turnover and gender. Yeah, look, I you know there's there's a lot of conversations I've been having around the impact of of moving to a hybrid kind of work and and the impact of remote yeah. work in the past twelve months on particularly on the female population, right? To to see you know are they picking up you know are they getting that break? Are they being you know are they being flexible about uh, their work days or are they working kind of longer hours and picking up? Yeah, sure. Another customer um, actually, which is which is really interesting, they looked at. Um, their behaviours of their uh, high-performing females versus yeah. their high-performing males, which was really exciting to to kind of start to understand, you know, things like um, do they have the same opportunities and the same uh, to, to network? Are they being coached by their one on one by their manager in one on one situations? And what they actually found out was that um, their uh, senior high-performing females weren't were getting just as much one-on-one -on -one time and coaching time with their manager and two up as their standard male performers. So with that data, they can then take action and make a change. And I think this is where you know where it's important for Osnet, right? You, you talk, you've talked to me about the importance of data and being able to take action on that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, like tell me, I think we'll, we'll come back a little bit more into to kind of other um, opportunities for using the data, but let's take back a step and, and kind of talk through that decision process or that process for, um, you know, using that behavioural data. We've talked about Joe being involved. Um, talk to me a bit more about um, this, um, that um, behavioural data and the importance of that. Um, to to be at actually you know what I've I've just totally <laughs> lost <laughs> I've just totally lost my my thread here right um so let's let's talk about the process we we had in terms of the Microsoft technology we looked at what were some of the things that you were contemplating going through your mind um, when we were discussing the 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 ability of behavioral part of that what I hear a lot and what I really emphasized at the start was that are we looking at individual data? So what were some of the questions that were being, um, that were going yeah. on behind the scenes and what did you have to do as a team to kind of assuage yeah. those fears and, and, and move on? Look, I think we're work still working through this and so we haven't got the answer on it yet, but I, I think, you know, we're, we're considering at the moment, you know, kind of privacy and ethical, you know, um, matters associated with this. It is aggregate data, um, but looking at this type of data is new for our organisation. So a lot of employees wouldn't have heard about it. So we need to actually figure out, um, you know, how we actually communicate what we're doing. We don't want this to be behind a, you know, a veil of secrecy, et cetera. And, you know, I think our, our view is, and, and we haven't quite got to that yet, but it is to be as transparent as possible because what we don't want to do is be trying to, you know, uh, gain these insights um, from this data to actually drive different ways of working, but in the process lose trust with our workforce. So it's a really important one um, and something we're turning our minds to, but we have, you know, we're still new in our journey there. So, so need to get to that fairly quickly though. Yeah, and look, that uh, it, it's not anything new for for organisations who who are looking at this type of data. And I think it's in, important to note that this is 
Um, again, you know, you're looking at aggregate data across the organisation and being sliced and diced. And I think you're so right. Um, we very much like one of the, the um, statements that Microsoft does make is about um, operating on trust. We're built on trust and we do partner with our customers around this particular place as well to make them feel comfortable with what they're doing. But I think that communication part is critical. And I think the governance piece as well to, you know, as you said, you know, you're starting to think about how do we communicate to our, our employees? Once you lose that trust with data, you, you have a very long way to go to get back there. So that communication, but I think also importantly, and I think you're you're working um, with one of our partners, Engage Squared, around setting up a, um, a, a discovery workshop to really be able to understand, well, what are the insights? What are the hypotheses we want to test? We're not just going in there um, willy-nilly. And I think you've, you've mentioned the diversity is one of them. Are there any other areas you're starting to, to at the moment before you do that workshop, some of the other areas you might be considering? Yeah, look, I've got a long list of things that I want to, you know, I just get excited and I've got all these questions I want to pose. I think that the challenge is to prioritise, but I think some of the things that are standing out, you know, particularly how do we overlay the workplace analytics data with our, with our, with our Glint data, you know, I, I think there's also an opportunity to really look at operating effectiveness. So look at, you know, a lot of, a lot of info mm -hmm. on, you know, how our business is operating in terms of its meeting structures, are they effective, um, you know, time spent in those layers of organisations, you know, that, do we have excessive amounts of meetings where there's three levels of organisation in there and therefore is that creating issues with empowerment, et cetera? You know, when we when we talk about, you know, some of our pulse surveys, we ask questions like, you know, um, yeah, is it easy to get things done around here, et cetera? If we can actually look at our effectiveness in terms of how we're using technology and collaboration to go, well, perhaps we're getting a low score here because of this. But but I think that some of the key insights will, will potentially come by looking at, for instance, our Glint data and, and, and looking at what the correlation is. Well, what are some of the behaviours of effective teams? Um, and, and, you know, is there a difference between those and, and or engaged teams and, and not engaged teams in how they're operating and how we can actually use that to, and I think the important bit is not only for this data to be used by execs but to actually equip our you know our HR business partners to be coaching leaders on different ways of um, operating etc and just trialing new things you know I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer in terms of you know whether it be meeting effectiveness or etc you know there's a lot of data there's a data we can access now around you know time you know one-on-ones with managers how much time or regularly employees are meeting with managers etc um, that's a great piece of data to understand that but what does good look like it may mean different mm -hmm. things for different areas so how do we actually correlate that with you know employee sentiment etc and understand um, you know what's what's going to work for different groups yeah look you've got some great examples there and I'm I'm like I'm scribbling down some of the things I think from a, a, C, a C suite diary, I'm like, I'm trying to schedule a, 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 um, a meeting with uh, someone at the moment who is the CEO of, a, of an organization to have a chat. He's really keen to talk to me. To get into his diary, uh, my meeting is like the middle of May. So yeah. that, that's the first available spot, and he's keen to see me, right? So if you start to think about an organization that's being innovative, being agile, does your meeting culture actually support that, right? Yeah. What can what can you do to to kind of improve that? Are there too many meetings that people are a part of? Can you make, you know, can you can you kind of optimize that and give people back their time? Because I think multitasking is definitely one of the things. I was sitting on meetings yesterday and I'm just yeah. like spinning out emails. So should I actually be on that call? Is there a better way of using uh, using my time? I think um, your point to um, empowering managers with insight is super critical because managers are the way to make that grassroots change, right? Yep. If you know, um, and I share this, this story actually, our senior leadership team here at Microsoft, so we use this technology and we use this um, these insights as part of our organisation um, and we're pretty much customer zero, right? We're all across it. But our senior leadership team here in Australia, we're having a meeting around our, our managed coach care ethos that we have for our managers and our leaders. Anyway, it came up in conversation around this manager one-on-one -on -one time and how important it is. And, and you know, as Microsoft, we, we know that we talk about that um, a lot. Um, and every all the senior leaders, leaders in the room were like, yeah, no problem. Yeah, no, we know how important it is. We do that. So the anecdotal evidence is saying, yep, no problem. Tick, we've got that. But then our business transformation lead, Liz Blatchford, love her to bits. She put, popped up a slide 
with the data. And everybody in the room just went, okay, I'm going to do something about that. So giving that that leaders that those insights were great because then that encouraged them to go back to their teams and say, hey, we're not doing so well. I mean, we're doing okay. We're getting there, but we need to do better. So empowering those insights to those managers actually create that grassroots yeah. change. And you can be looking at, you know, um, you can then look at change programs for the bigger pieces like diversity. Yeah. And actually, one or two also, I think one of the other things we chatted about was um, making sure when you com you're communicating to your employees and saying, right, this is what I um, this is what we're going to explore, on the um, continuing with that communication too, it's important I think to also tell the employees, hey, you know what this is what we're going to do with the data because it's no point in just playing around and exploring gender-based insights for example if you don't have the resources to take action on what you find out and so it's very very critical that you be specific about your hypothesis like you are and being you know prioritizing stuff there yeah absolutely so I think um, I haven't seen too many questions come through, but Elise and I are going to um, pop out into uh, onto the table. So feel free to, to come and have a chat to us. But yeah, I think, you know, it's it's been fabulous having a chat to you today and, and just thinking like, you know, you've gone through this journey. It's not hard. You don't you don't have a team of 15, right? No, I don't. I don't. I have kind of two FTEs in my in, in the team in this space. So, yeah, not at all. Yeah. So you don't, you know, you don't need to start with, you know, a massive team of data scientists or very technical knowledge about this particular space. You can start from small and build up to there, but getting that sponsor, I think, is key. Andrea, welcome back. Hello. So um, thank you both very much. Insights on research and, and data. I keep saying data. It's that. Me. Um, uh, so what I'll do is I'll turn the presentation off. If you two sit on a table together and everyone, um, we think we can fit about six to eight of you on a table. So if you've asked a question, move off and other people can join you. And in your groups at your tables, why don't we have a bit of a discussion about, you know, what data are you currently collecting and using to understand employee performance and how they feel DNI and all of those sorts of things. It's such a new area for so many people um, and an and area that's very a lot stronger overseas but growing in interest here as well. 